Hello, my name is Chris Holgreff. I'm the director of a new nonprofit organization called the International Interactive Computing Collaboration, or 2I2C. And today what I want to talk about is a little bit about the background and history of 2I2C, the sort of pathway that we took to get to where we are right now, and give you an idea of the kinds of things that we want to work on next and the kinds of change that we want to affect in the world. So before I go any further, if you're interested in getting a copy of these slides, you can find them at this bit.ly link right here. And I'll just pause there for a second in case anybody needs to copy that. Um, and before diving into 2I2C specific stuff, I thought I'd give a little bit of background about myself. So uh, my background is actually originally in neuroscience. That was kind of how I got introduced into the open source ecosystem um, at UC Berkeley. And over the course of graduate school, I sort of got more and more involved in doing open source work, in my case, specifically for neuroscience. Um, but then that got me plugged into the Jupiter project, which has always had a, a team of people at UC Berkeley. Um, and Fernando Perez, who's one of the founders of, of Jupiter, as well as one of the founders now of 2I2C, has been a, a professor there for quite some time. Um, and when I got involved in the Jupiter project at Berkeley, I started focusing specifically on this issue of shared infrastructure in the Jupiter ecosystem. So how can we deploy Jupiter environments along with the, you know, the rest of the, the open source stack that's needed to do data analysis for different uh, use cases at the university, either in research or in education. So I worked quite a lot on the Zero to Jupyter Hub guide for Kubernetes. Um, we also worked on a few projects around shareable, interactive, reproducible environments via the Binder project. And we helped run a really large Jupyter Hub for uh, Berkeley's education efforts uh, for a course called Data8 and the Data Hub. And you'll learn a little bit more about that later. So the reason that I'm interested in Jupyter and that I think it's a really powerful platform is because I think that there's a really interesting space where people and computers interact in a very fluid and dynamic way. Um, and I use the word interactive computing to describe that pattern of interaction, sort of really fast, flexible, rapid feedback. You're playing around with ideas, you're exploring data, you're asking questions and, and you're getting quick answers to them. And the Jupyter ecosystem is a community of people that build tools and standards and workflows around that interactive computing um, idea. So the most popular tools that the Jupyter ecosystem puts out are the Jupyter Notebook um, and Jupyter Lab. The Notebook is a sort of document-driven linear interface where you can interweave code and analyses and um, prose that sort of explains the work that you're doing. And Jupyter Lab is a more modern, more flexible user interface for these interactive computing workflows. Um, and I just want to lead with a couple of examples of where I think that this has been particularly powerful in research and education. So one of them is for enabling large-scale scientific research, in this case, in the geosciences. The Pangeo project is a large community platform for geospatial analytics in the cloud, um, and specifically around these kind of big data, humongous data sets that would never fit on one person's computer kinds of workflows. So they provide an online platform via a Jupyter interface and, and a whole lot of other open source packages that gives people the ability to churn through and ask questions about really large data sets, but from the comfort of their own laptop. And by in doing so, they control uh, infrastructure that the Pangeo project both curates and provides and manages in the cloud, which gives them this kind of seamless ability to um, leverage the power and the, and the flexibility of the cloud but in a very familiar way where you're just running you know, typical commands from your own uh, local browser or, or notebook interface. And just as one example of this, I wanted to show a quick video. This is gonna be a video of someone displaying an image and then zooming in on that image. And really what seems to happen is nothing exceptional. Basically the image zooms in and then it recomputes a new resolution to display. But what you'll see happening under the hood, if you look at the bottom of the screen, is once that zoom in uh, occurs, a bunch of Dask jobs are fired off. And this is actually running on a scalable Kubernetes cluster under the hood. So the data set that this person is looking at is actually many terabytes in size. So it would never be able to fit into memory. And if you want to visualize it, you have to visualize a subset of that data and you have to be efficient about how you're visualizing it. And so using these interactive interfaces, you can allow a very common operation, like just zooming in and dragging on an image to control a, a fairly sophisticated set of infrastructure. In this case, a scalable Dask cluster that knows, okay, you've zoomed in on this part of the image. Now I need to fire off a bunch of Dask workers to recompute the resolution and load in the data in a way that I can now um, manipulate and, and view on my own. 
And I think that this is a really good example of where it's a very familiar interface. If you're a user, it will feel like you're just working on your own laptop and it'll feel like the computation you run was trivial. But what actually happened was a fairly sophisticated, both technically and scientifically, um, analysis pipeline that allowed you to recompute the image at the new resolution that you wanted. Um, underneath that is a Jupyter-powered, um, PyData ecosystem-powered stack that connects to object storage, which is a way of storing really large data sets in the cloud. And again, kind of abstracts away a whole lot of complexity so that as an individual, you can just be sitting at your laptop and really quickly churn through terabytes of data in just a couple of seconds. Another example of this stack is in the case of teaching, um, in this case, introductory data science via the Data 8 course at UC Berkeley. So UC Berkeley has this really large data, set, uh, really large, uh, data science course that is meant for really anybody at the university. It's a first year introductory course. It's meant for both people who are gonna go on to be data scientists um, and statisticians, but also for people who want nothing to do with data science as sort of a core career, people who are gonna go into you know, literature or political science or economics, um, who just believe that they want to have a kind of data-driven framework for thinking and, and learning about how to ask questions quantitatively and statistically. That's what this class is for. Um, and as you can imagine, at UC Berkeley, this is a big challenge because when you have an introductory data science course meant for anybody at a huge public university, you're also going to get huge courses. And this on the bottom is an example of, I think day one of class maybe two years ago, so they have over a thousand students in this course. It's really, really popular. They have to fill you know, auditoriums on campus that weren't meant for teaching. And so to facilitate all of the teaching and learning in this case, we provide a Jupyter Hub for all of these students called the Data Hub. And that Jupyter Hub has a curated data science environment that allows the students to just go to a website, authenticate against their UC Berkeley account, and immediately start diving into the material that's been created for the course. We also host all of the, um, the content for the course as Jupyter Notebooks, as a, a public facing static website using a tool called Jupyter Book. And so again, there's the same familiar faces in this stack. We have Jupyter Hub providing interactive computing uh, access to cloud infrastructure for a bunch of students. We're using familiar interfaces in the Jupyter ecosystem, the sort of PyData, NumPy, SciPy stack to teach all of this material. And then we leverage other public services like GitHub um, and the, the website hosting platform on GitHub called GH Pages to provide like a textbook for all of the students that can connect to the Jupyter Hub. So each of these pieces that we've seen now are useful both for research and for education. And then the last thing that I wanted to note is that we've also seen a lot of really interesting case studies in using this infrastructure to basically make the cloud more accessible, make these environments more accessible to a more diverse audience of people. Um, and the first example I'll give about this is something called Syzygy. So Syzygy is a project run out of Canada. And effectively what Syzygy does is it provides federated Jupyter Hub instances for Canadian universities across the country. Uh, I think that they provide Jupyter Hubs for more than something like 20 different universities. And really it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you're a university, you're in Canada and you want to run some kind of shared interactive computing infrastructure, you can reach out to Syzygy and they will run that infrastructure for you on Canadian uh, cloud infrastructure. So this is a, a partnership, I think, with a, a group called Calcul Quebec um, and a few other infrastructure providers in, in Canada. And so in this way, all of these universities are able to access this infrastructure without needing to deploy it and run it themselves. Another interesting example is something called the Binder Project. So this is a really large open public service that a few of us in the Jupyter Project run that's focused more around um, interactive, reproducible, and shareable environments. And really the most important thing about the Binder Project that I wanna highlight here is this plot on the right. So that's a, a map of launches on mybinder.org over I think uh, 2020. And what you'll see is that basically there are launches happening there from every single country in the entire world. And I think this is really powerful because cloud infrastructure means that you don't need to buy a $2,000 laptop in order to run some interesting data science work on your own machine. You can just go to a website, in this case, mybinder.org, and have access to a much wider range of infrastructure than you might otherwise be able to have access to. So I think that this kind of technology has a lot of potential for just growing the ability for a, a, a more diverse population of people to leverage this infrastructure. So I think that these are success stories because they all follow a very similar model, which is basically 
curating a subset of open source packages and infrastructure that's needed for a particular problem. problem. They then customize that infrastructure and deploy it for a particular community. And then because all of the infrastructure they're running is open source and part of other communities that they're, they're um, contributing to, all of the improvements that they need for that infrastructure can be done via contributing to upstream open source packages and, and communities that are out there. There are a lot of other benefits that come from this as well. The, the people that run this infrastructure have total control over it. You also have total transparency into what's going on underneath the hood. That means you can reuse the same stack for other cases, um, as we saw here, both for you know, research and education, which are often quite different use cases. You can basically use the exact same tools for all of them. And students are using the exact same stack that they're also gonna be using in the real world because this kind of PyData Jupyter ecosystem is the closest thing to a community standard that exists across both academia and the private sector and industry and government. However, the other thing that we've found is that these success stories have been really hard to replicate. Um, over the last couple of years, we've done a ton of work in building documentation and trying to make the software itself more sustainable and, and more stable um, in doing community work and, and running workshops and boot camps, all to try and sort of build a community of practice around deploying and maintaining this cloud infrastructure for interactive computing. And we've definitely had some success along those lines. A lot of different organizations have gotten involved. People have you know, learned Kubernetes and started deploying their own Jupyter hubs um, institutionally using this stack. But one of the things that we found is that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how well documented the tools are, running cloud infrastructure still requires a fair amount of specialized expertise, um, as well as a lot of time to maintain and, and operate and keep it running over time. And for a lot of the institutions that we were hoping would adopt this stack, in particular, smaller institutions like small community colleges, for example, asking them to build their own in-house cloud infrastructure and DevOps expertise was just a non-starter. It was something that was untenable for them to do. Um, and as a result of this, a lot of them were starting to turn to various vendor products that were out there. There are lots of different notebook as a service um, products and, and, and companies out there that will offer these kinds of environments to you as a service. Um, but I don't think that these are a long-term solution specifically for the research and education community. Um, they tend to use proprietary interfaces and APIs. They tend to come from ecosystems that are supported by a single organization, usually the company that's offering the service rather than just offering um, technology from multi-stakeholder organizations like the, the Jupyter community. Um, and in, in general, they just tend to reduce the amount of flexibility and choice that we have as academic and research and education communities in deploying our infrastructure and using the environments wherever we want to. Um, and ideally sort of in partnership with the open source communities that are out there. And at the same time, there's a different class of sustainability challenges for this model, which is that you know, the open source communities that underlie all of this infrastructure also need a lot of support. So whether it's running services and maintaining them, whether it's building and maintaining software, um, working with others across the ecosystem to define protocols or doing a ton of community and, and people work to try to keep this ecosystem thriving, that requires a lot of time and expertise and, and resources to accomplish. Um, and while the Jupyter ecosystem, for example, has grown exponentially in its use and in its impact, in, in this example, I'm just showing you the number of publicly available Jupyter notebooks on GitHub, and it's got a, a near exponential curve, and we're getting close to 10 million public notebooks on GitHub. Even though we've seen a huge growth in the impact that the Jupyter project has had, that growth hasn't come with a commensurate increase in resources and attention and, and time for the Jupyter project. And this is a real challenge because as these tools grow in their usage and again in their impact, they also grow in their complexity. They tend to grow in the amount of demand that different user communities are placing on them. Um, and managing all of this requires resources. And those are resources that thus far have been hard to come by through purely volunteer labor. So one of the things that we're hoping to do, and, and I think that there's sort of a missing niche of organization in this space, is to have organizations that sort of exist in between open source communities and communities in research and education and in the public service. Um, I think that there's a real opportunity in having more organizations that fit in between those two worlds because the mission of those two different communities is different, but I think aligned in their values and in the change that they want to affect in the world. 
Um, moreover, I think something that we've found in the Jupyter community over the years is that the more people you have using a tool and providing feedback from a particular perspective, like research and education, the more useful that tool tends to become for those communities. And so I think that there is this uh, space in the middle where an organization can both represent the interests and the use cases of research and education, um, but can also provide services for the research and education community that use the open source stack that, uh, that I've been describing here in this talk. And you can create a kind of feedback loop where this stack is useful and so you can deploy it for research and education. You can get resources for doing those deployments that then feed back into open source development and the communities underlying that stack. And in turn, it becomes more useful for research and education. And you can kind of create a, a self-perpetuating feedback loop. And that's really the goal behind 2i2c, or the International Interactive Computing Collaboration. So our hope is that we can try to create one organization that fills that niche. Uh, 2i2c is a nonprofit project. It's a subset of another nonprofit called ICSI, or the International Computer Science Institute. Um, it's a mission-driven organization with the goal of supporting interactive computing workflows uh, in the research and education community. And it basically wants to be three things. One is a service provider of cloud infrastructure. Two is a collaborator for research and educators who want uh, access to open source development in this interactive computing and, and Jupyter stack. And finally, we want to be a strong contributor and a strong community member and leader in the open source communities that underlie this stack. Um, and we're really trying to create 2i2c drawing from our experience over many, many years of deploying the kinds of shared interactive computing infrastructure that I described earlier in this talk. So I'm gonna focus on the kind of managed infrastructure part of this, because I think in some ways it's the most um, interesting, but really our goal is to do nothing too fancy or nothing too you know, magical and black boxy. What we wanna do is offer customized, Jupyter Hub interactive computing infrastructure in the cloud that's built entirely with open tools and open standards, and it's tailored for the research and education community. We want that infrastructure to be completely transparent and configurable both by us or by you. So what we really don't want to do is allow you to just not think about this infrastructure uh, if what you prefer is to understand kind of what, what's happening under the hood, how we are deploying it for you, and how you could take that yourself and go off and do your own thing without 2i2c. Um, and we also want to position 2i2c in a way that it's easy to work with us institutionally. So for example, if your department just wants a Jupyter Hub for you know, teaching or for your research groups, we want to make it really easy to just partner with us and we can provide that infrastructure for you um, and sort of move on from there. Um, 2i2c at its core is dedicated to open source communities in, in this interactive computing space, as well as to the research and the education communities that we hope to serve. So the basic idea here is that we're trying to define some of the really common patterns that have proven useful for the research and education communities. And at first, we're gonna draw from um, the experiences in Pangeo with their Berkeley Data Hubs, with uh, Syzygy and the MyBinder project to basically define a set of sort of template hub architectures that we think are useful for a particular class of problems. Um, we can begin with those uh, those setups and then customize it from there. So, you know, a, a community in neuroscience probably doesn't want the exact same environment as Pangeo, but they probably do want, you know, X-Array and a scalable Dask Kubernetes cluster and things like that. So we can make it really easy to start with most of the infrastructure that you need and then make it possible for you to kind of add your own customizations on top of it so that you get a hub infrastructure that's tailored for your community. Um, again, all of the deployment, configuration, integration, infrastructure for all of this should be public um, and in a repository that anybody can inspect and in turn that anybody can contribute to and add their own improvements if they wish. Um, and in the future, I think what we're also hoping to do is use our experiences working with research and education to create new kinds of hub deployments and hub setups that we maybe haven't imagined yet, but that would nonetheless be particularly useful. I think one of the interesting um, constraints that we're putting on ourselves and that sort of reflects our, our adherence to our values as an organization is something that we call the right to replicate. And essentially what this means is that we believe that um, users or customers of interactive computing infrastructure should have the right to replicate that infrastructure stack in its entirety 
anywhere else with or without 2i2c. So, you know, on your own hardware in a different cloud vendor um, and with enough guidance and handholding that you don't have to, you know, completely start from scratch in order to move away from 2i2c and just manage that infrastructure yourself. And that requires things like, you know, promising that we're only going to use open standards, open source technology, open infrastructure, but it also means a commitment to sort of partnering with the organizations we work with and helping them learn how to run that infrastructure. So we're still playing around with the different models of how we can form these partnerships. I think we think of 2i2c hubs as a kind of collaboration between 2i2c and various leaders in the research and education communities that we wish to serve. Um, what we want to do is to give others the ability to sort of give their input and guidance of the hub up to the point that they want. And then 2i2c can worry about the kind of operations and the maintenance and the support of the cloud infrastructure and the kind of back-end things that many researchers and educators just don't want to have to worry about. Um, and that's a model, again, that we're sort of playing around with right now and we're trying to refine over time as we run through different um, pilot hubs with, with a few different collaborators. So that's like a very high level overview of 2i2c. Um, as I mentioned before, it's a very young organization and there's still a ton of things that we need to do to get uh, everything up and running. The next things that we need to do are basically figuring out what is our sustainability model going to be around you know, deploying this infrastructure as a service, using that in order to generate some kind of resource and revenue stream that we can then put back into the open source community. That's a, a complex problem that's very different from the kind of open source work that we've been doing in the past. Um, at the same time, we're figuring out the kind of infrastructure stack that we want to deploy for these various communities. I hinted at that a little bit around you know, research hubs and education hubs, but there's a lot of work that we can do to, to reduce the amount of labor associated with the maintaining and operating that infrastructure. Um, and then finally, we're trying to build a sort of community of practice, both within 2i2c and between 2i2c and other research communities in learning about you know, how can we best use cloud infrastructure and this open source ecosystem to serve the needs of these particular communities. So if you're from an organization or if you have a research group that you think would be interested in partnering with 2i2c on um, some of this hub infrastructure, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, at the same time, if you think that you have some valuable expertise in you know, sustainable open source or nonprofit models, um, models that, that show how you can provide services to research and education in a way that you know, both is sustainable for those organizations and sustainable for you, we would love to just chat with you and, and learn about what you have to offer. And then finally, if you have or know of any resources, grants, um, philanthropy, that can go towards helping build up this uh, open infrastructure or fund open source development underlying this infrastructure, uh, then I would love to talk and please don't hesitate to reach out. So thanks very much for uh, letting me talk a little bit about the, the creation and the background of 2i2c. Here are a couple of links that you can use to learn a little bit more about the things that we're working on right now. Um, and at the bottom, there's contact information for myself. So I look forward to talking to you in the future and thanks very much.